Welcome everybody. We are thrilled that Lisa B. Thompson is here to launch the 2021-2022 Alum Fellows Reading Series. And we are excited that actors Jeffrey Dashade Johnson and Mark Pouet are joining Lisa for a reading of her acclaimed play, Underground. Mark Anthony Neal has said that, quote, Lisa captures the magic, trauma, and most importantly, the humor and laughter of Black life and offers us a lifeline to the could have beens and should have beens that we can take for our own, unquote. Jeff Jeffrey Dashe Johnson is an actor, poet, filmmaker, film curator, and a fight choreographer for stage and film. He is a 2017 B. Iden Payne Award winner for Outstanding Actor in a Drama for his role as Mason Dixon in Underground. Mark Pouet is an actor who has won multiple Austin Critics Table Awards and received the John Buston Award for Conspicuous Versatility. He has been recognized by the Austin Chronicle as the best of Austin, best classic leading men. Lisa B. Thompson is a theater artist and a scholar of African American studies. She is the Patton Professor of African and African Diaspora Studies and affiliate faculty in English, theater and dance, and women and gender studies at the University of Texas at Austin. The author of Single Black Female, Beyond the Black Lady, Sexuality, and the New African American Middle Class, and Underground Monroe and the Monologues, three plays. Lisa is the recipient of fellowships from the American Council of Learned Societies, McDowell, Hedgebrook, and the University of California's Office of the President, among many others. Her awards include the Broadway World Regional Award for Best Writing of an Original Work, the Irma P. Hall Black Theater Best Play Award, and the Austin Critics Circle David Mark Cohen New Play Award. She was recently granted a National Performance Network Creation Fund Award for her new performance art piece, The Black Feminist Guide to the Human Body. So welcome, Lisa, Jeffrey, and Mark. Thank you for present, presenting to us. And Lisa, would you mind telling us a little bit about Underground? Thank you for having me. It's great to be back uh, virtually. I hope to be back again in person sometime soon. Uh, Underground is a drama that reunites Kyle and Mason, a pair of old college buddies who have gone from radicals in their youth to successful professionals approaching middle age. And when <laughs> Kyle shows up at Mason's door, the two have a chance to catch up, reminisce, and as the evening goes on, engage one another in a battle of intellects over the best road to Black liberation. And we're going to have a reading of an excerpt of it now. Let me, uh, let me hold on one second. Stop it. All right. Underground by Lisa B. Thompson. Setting 2017, Mason Dixon's impeccable 1855 Brownstone in Albany, New York. It was once a stop on the Underground Railroad, but it has been professionally re renovated and restored to its prior glory. The action takes place over one long winter evening. What follows is an excerpt from Act One. Mason receives a text. He reads it and jumps up to turn on the television. Okay. Okay. Kyle. <laughs> hey. Man, check this out. No, it's really jumping off now. Mason turns up the volume on a news program while Kyle begins rolling another joint. Both men begin texting furiously. What began in California just a few weeks ago has begun to spread east. Police and federal agents continue to look for suspects in connection with several bombings at government buildings in the West. They're on the hunt. Mm. Sources close to the investigation say that those incidents are con connected to the recent explosions in the New York metropolitan area. Officials have declined to release the names of the suspects, citing national security concerns. 
national security. <laughs> right. These motherfuckers always want to raise the stakes. I can't believe this bullshit. Our sources have also revealed that the focus is on apprehending the leaders or leader behind new movement. A radical group similar to the Black Panthers, their tactics include the use of deadly force and authorities believe. Oh, deadly force? Yeah. Well, they're tracking them like a runaway slave. Damn. Well, they can't snuff out a movement once it has ignited the imagination of the people. What are you talking about? This isn't a game. And I can't believe these folks out here on some terrorism shit. It's a resistance. This is what it looks like to fight back. I understand that, but when you're talking about violence, loss of life. Loss of life. As far as I know, new movement hasn't killed anybody. Yet. Come on. The media always got to take it there when our folks are involved. The propaganda machine is the real deadly force. Wait, 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 wait. This is not just sensational journalism. They're out here bombing shit, man. Yeah, things, not people. Statues of long dead white men can't die again. Empty buildings. Those armed militia white boys had a national park occupied for months and they were called peaceful protesters. Come on, Kay. They're setting off explosives. They're also igniting imaginations. New movement ain't no joke. Insurrection. It's about time. They can't continue with this injustice and expect to ride for free throughout eternity. Negotiating for a payday with a finger on the trigger? That's terrorism. That's revolution. They're tripping. For real, man. This won't end well. Flashback to 1988, the offices of the Black Student Union. Kyle is playing <clears throat> solitaire. Hey, Prep, what are you doing up here? Hey, I just wanted to see what was up, man. I heard you at the rally. Yeah, you got some of that soul food, huh? Yeah, I like what you said. Apartheid must fall, young brother. We need divestment now. That's why I'm here. I want to join. I want to help. You want to join us, huh? Weren't you just pledging Alpha? Kappa. But it wasn't for me. Is that right? <laughs> Too much stepping and not going nowhere, huh? <laughs> Something like that. Uh -huh. Well, man, I don't want there to be any confusion. This ain't nothing like a frat, young blood. We are the BSA. We are men and women of purpose who are about the business of our people. I'm chairman of the Black Student Association, the only radical organization on this entire campus. No step shows, no line brothers, no parties, no sorority girls. Well, a few, but no <laughs> bullshitting. This is about overturning the status quo. This is about changing the world. And remember this, if you don't remember anything else, ain't no quitting allowed. I understand. Come by Friday night. The crew got to check you out, see how you think. You up for some Midwest and spades? Mm, uh, yeah, I, I'll come by, but I don't play cards. All right. You slap some bones? No bones either. Nah, I can't play dominoes, but I can learn. What do you play? Chess. What's that? I'm sorry, don't be shy, speak up. Chess. I play chess. Chess! Chess! <laughs> You're a real white boy, ain't you? Excuse me? I, I, I'm just fucking with you. I dig chess. That's a cool game. My uncle taught me back in the day while he uh, was doing a bid in San Quentin. Ah, San Quentin. Yeah. Now, I grew up playing chess at the crib. My father calls it the ultimate game of strategy. <laughs> you ever use a timer? It raises no. stakes. Nah, but I can learn. I'm oh, getting... you want to be white? What? Your pieces. You want black. white? Black. I don't listen. I'm usually black, but I'll let you have it this time. Well, thank you. Just remember, power concedes nothing without demand. It never has, 
It never will. It never will. The youngster does know a few things. Your move. So, your uncle there when George Jackson was locked up? Nah, he did his bid later. Hmm. Yeah, I've seen you around. You got a nice little rep from that column you write for the paper. I just write what's on my mind. You know, I think divestment from South Africa is the most important issue I think we're facing globally. You don't say. Well, that editorial about the ANC was on point. Folks have taken notice. Thank you. You know, I write about local issues too. Yeah, your piece on the faculty was nice. Yeah, there's only one black professor in the English department and he doesn't even have tenure. Oh, nice move. Thank you. What else do you feel passionate about? Uh, cost of tuition. Uh -huh. I mean, it's so high, I gotta work 20 hours a week, plus take out loans, you know. My mom can't help me pay. I live at the, at the crib to help out. You know, things are kind of- Hard uh, not. Hmm? Well, money ain't everything, trust me. Better for folks to owe you than for you to owe them. If you owe them, they own you. Don't let nobody get you caught up chasing that dough. That's easy to say when you got it. When you don't. Oh, damn. Sweet move. I like how you think. Thanks. You know, timers throwing me off a little bit, but yeah, I'll get the hang of it. So you're a senior, right? Senior. Well, a fifth year senior. Hey, it's cool that you can afford an extra year. Well, the parents will keep paying as long as I'm staying out of trouble. If they only knew, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I decided to stick around an extra year to make sure that the organization is on solid ground. It's a critical year for us. The BSA has many projects on campus, in and around the community, especially in the jails and prisons. We have ties to others nationally too. Some of our programs are basic, and others are a bit more uh, complex. A few of them are risky. Yeah, and I understand that's why I'm here, okay? I'm not worried about danger. I mean, at the rally, you said time is of the essence. Oh, I'm ready. I agree that if we don't act now- Whoa, 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 whoa. slow down, young blood. I can see that you're eager. The issue is not your willingness, but your trustworthiness. Look, I'm a man of my word. Honor and integrity are everything. Huh. What would your former line brothers say about that? I'll recruit them to join the fight too. Okay. Persuasive, deliberate, strategic, and brave too. I'm liking how you think, Dix. Thanks, Kyle. Call me Kay. All right. Kay. So, you claim you're trustworthy, but are you hard? Hard. Yeah, hard, rugged, badass. Are you tough enough to stand the pressure? If so, maybe someday you'll be the BSA chair. Just watch me. Nobody really knows what they're made of until they're face to face with the devil himself. Mm. Queen takes pawn. See, you thought you had me. Check me. There it is. <laughs> there it is. I like you, Dix. I want you to help me with a little errand later. Meet me here tonight at midnight. Midnight. That's right. Come alone. Don't be late. You can count on me. Back to the present. Several hours have passed. They're both drunk now and listening to music. Bob Marley's Get Up Stand Up is ending. <laughs> oh, you press send on that joint like, thank you, muscle, for letting me free. <laughs> hey, man, I am nobody's slave, but I can't lie. I'm relieved to be done with that shit. Another ironclad contract courtesy of Mason and Dixon. <laughs> Just doing what I do. Mm. Man, there ain't nothing like the sound of vinyl, Dix. That is soul food. Parliament Funkadelic's One Nation Under a Groove begins to play. 
Hey, hey, you remember this? Yes, uh. the funk, the whole funk, nothing but the funk. Nothing can stop us now. Uh. One nation under a groove. Get down, just hold oh, the funk of it. Come on, nothing man. Come on. can stop us now. <laughs> That's what folks need, the funk. That will lead us out of this wilderness in America. Yep. Um, but come on, man. You know, it's a cycle. You know, no matter what is happening now, things have changed substantially. Now, don't forget, our last president was a brother. Oh, 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 was is was. Besides, his ass wasn't my brother. Oh, that dude was way too accommodationist for me. Mm. That's the problem with polite Negroes. Come on. They're always trying to be acceptable. Acceptable. Always worried about being respectable. Always worried about the optics. Too worried about <laughs> scaring white folks. Look, I know, but man, we got to. What? Huh? He should have been swinging for the fences when he had the chance. The minute he got in office, he should have pushed for everything we deserve. You bougie Negroes can have him. Always talking down to black folk, talking about Black men not knowing how to be fathers and telling folk to check your kids' homework, like that's news. Black folk don't need all his pull yourself up by the bootstraps garbage. Damn, man, come calm down, Cornell West. All right, come on. All right, he was just saying what we've heard all the brothers say in the barbershops for years. Yeah, yeah, it's fine and good when he's addressing the Negro, but the town mm -hmm. got real salty it's when he started so clowning folks in Morehouse, huh? <clears throat> Mm. Hard. Stop complaining. Uh, do your best. The mm -hmm. world uh, doesn't owe you anything. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that Negroes was up in arms. Man, that was crazy. Straight uh, up. Well, none of that matters now. Puts on an old hip hop song. Nah, says, if I rule the world. We are where we are. Our people are at the mercy of a madman. The time is now, Dix. You can't be happy with the way things are for our young people. Ain't nobody hiring them. Schools ain't teaching them their history, let alone what they need to know to survive. Shit, we were fighting for our lives with him in office. What the hell you expect us to do now? Play nice and wait for the next executive order? This fool might reinstate slavery at this rate. I'm not blind. I know these are dire times, but we can't allow that to make us lose ourselves. Dire times? D dire times? They are setting us on the road to annihilation. Not only are they closing off the borders, but they're locking us up with them. What? What is their ultimate plan? Our schools are prisons with armed police roaming the halls. More and more of these crackers acting like it's the wild, wild west out here in these streets. This is genocide. They've been picking our sons and daughters off one by one. And for what? Trying to get help after a car accident? For playing with a toy in the park? For carrying a bottle of lemonade and candy? No, it was iced tea and Skittles. What? It wasn't lemonade, it was iced tea. Nigga, I don't care if it was a goddamn 40 ounce and a blunt. They are killing them for being black. Look, the details matter. The truth does matter. The facts matter. We can't lose our principles just because. Just because. Don't tell me what matters. Black lives matter, motherfucker. What matters is that a black man dies at the hands of the enemy every 36 hours. These fools are using our bodies for target practice and our souls for worse. Those are my principles. Is it always so simple? So black and white. You've never had one moment of doubt, a second of wavering. You've never wondered just once if your way is the right way. No, I haven't. Okay, so never. you're going to tell me, you're going to tell me that you're absolutely sure what you've done in any instant. I've got to be sure. Okay, okay. So if you got a call that someone had a gun in a park where kids are playing, you wouldn't act right away? 
Now remember, you've got one in the chamber. You're hyped up, ready to defend everybody you think is in danger. A danger to who? It was a toy gun. With the safety tip torn off. And in that split second, a scared man had to decide whether to be a hero for all those innocent people on that playground or take the risk of being a villain for taking the life of the wrong person. No, not just the wrong person, a child, a little boy. You and I both know he should have, no, no, no. He would have taken just a few seconds to make sure of that situation if that child was blue eyed with blonde hair. Are there any dead white children with toy guns you know about? Let me know. Uh, Louisiana, a couple of years ago, cops lit up a car with an unarmed white man and a six-year-old son. The son died, the son was autistic. Okay, okay, yes, I heard about that case. It's not comparable. Those cops were- The two black cops. Oh, yes, those two black cops didn't know he was even in the car. You know, post a child for reverse police brutality. I bet you can't name a black cop who has murdered a white child while looking him in the face. By the way, those cops have been charged with attempted murder. I know that. Well, do you know that black men are 21 times more likely to be killed by police than white ones? Of course I do. And that's criminal. But I can't let that define my life. Ain't nobody talking about individual lives. I'm talking about the collective. Oh, and uh, I think some of those stats are a little exaggerated. Messed up. Come the hell on, dicks. We are being slaughtered, not just by the fucking police, but by random crazies who feel completely empowered to do so. We cannot let this stand. From Emmett Till to Trayvon Martin, it has got to stop. There will always be ugliness and scared white people and racism. That's not oh, come me. Come on, okay? man. You no, don't change. You no, I don't even believe you're you talking this mess. You need to vote for progressive you know, means. Selling out, kid. That's the protest adjustments. Some voting uh, booth? Justices, and then, you know, go courts? to the federal courts. Marching? What century are you living in? That shit's done, brother. They stay stealing elections, and they're turning the clock back every day in the courts. Those old methods are for history books and that new museum they let the new Negroes have to house their dead and their memories of greatness. I don't need it. My heroes are all living. Okay, okay. So I guess uh, these, these uh, new tactics will set us free. New movement ain't playing. If these folks want to keep talking about the nation's greatness and stand your ground, they're going to find out just how shaky that ground is in this supposedly great nation. <laughs> If that's how you see it, you have your strategy, I'll stick to mine. One, one can always change course. It's never too late to self-correct. No need to stay stuck in the past. No shame in changing up your game, player. At this point in my life, I'm not interested in playing games. You may not be interested, but sometimes we have no choice but to play. And scene. I love you guys. Oh my God. Josh Shade, Jeffrey Josh Shade Johnson, Mark Puhay. <laughs> Um, reprising the roles from the world premiere of Underground in Austin, Texas at the Vortex. Um, these are my brothers. Uh, this is so compelling and absorbing. I wish we could go on. <laughs> Perhaps we should have a part two. Yes, um, in person. <laughs> definitely. Um, as our audience, um, processes and comes up with their comments and questions. I I have one. Um, so you must have performed underground and or excerpts from underground to various audiences. Um, and this audience that you have now is, is very academic. Do you find that your performances or readings shift at all with the idea, with the thought of the audience? In mind. Not, not at all. Which was interesting is, is this show was a, was a landmark moment in Austin theater um, 
the production was put on the cover of our kind of like the Village Voice, you know, the Austin Chronicle, which is kind of the Village Voice of Austin, uh, with me and uh, Shade and, uh, and Mark. And um, it won the, the, you know, New Play Award for the city. And I've sent it out for, and now it's been, it was 2017, so it's 2022 soon, and no one will touch it. And I think it would, if people were, for one thing, thought it was so on the nose, because I wrote it, of course, before um, we had that last president. And people were like, oh my God, you know, <laughs> you have a crystal ball. So, you know, can you write a play about us getting free? So that will happen too. Um, yeah, I'll, <laughs> I don't know. It's kind of interesting. Even seeing like female, there's been things I wrote, seemed like female that came true, that, that actually no, didn't come true. People started, it was, I'll tell you about that later. It was really interesting that, that there was people, there was a lot, a whole section of, of white men that they thought were sexy. And every time I have the show, they would be they would be killed in real life. So the first time we did see my female, the, the the crush was John John, and so we'd pull pull the name, of course, because it was you know. And they, I, Heath Ledger was in there. It was just bizarre. So um, I have this kind of mystical power, I guess. So um, but both of uh, seeing the future in interesting ways. So uh, the, the 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 response has been consistent. The talkbacks were very interesting. Um, sometimes people felt like um, they didn't want to deal with the racial stuff and um, or also were like, you, you should do something with this. And it's like, well, it's not our, you know, we didn't create this issue. So, you know, why don't you do something with it um, and, and, and move forward with what the racial justice needs to look like. So, um, but be, I, I hope that somebody will be courageous enough to put the, the show on. We're talking about you know, insurrection by Black folks. So maybe that's not <laughs> something people want to put on stage right now. Thank you. I think Adrian Childs has a question. Hi, thank Hi, you. Adrian. Hi, congratulations again. You know, I haven't thank seen you. the play or read it. So I would like to know how, what, how does it resolve? Does any one of, either one of them come out on top or convince the other? And um, I know you probably get this question all the time, but would how would it have in the last you know since George Floyd and and COVID would would your conversation be different? Um, you know because this is pre I mean that the the, the latest um, swelling you know which has been so impactful. I would think that everybody would want to put this prescient uh, play on. <laughs> We did have a reading last, I guess, Tuesday, which summer was now, I guess it was summer of 2020, where a theater in San Antonio did a reading with, with casting both um, the amazing actors um, in it. And they said, you know, we'll, you know, we'll be in touch with, you know, well, the next, you know, when, when we would go on, we can go on stage and this would be great. So we'll see, hopefully, I'm looking at you, uh, uh, <laughs> Public Theater of San Antonio and, and, and anywhere, but, um, I don't want to give away what happens uh, for those who would see, but the the I think that we're still having this conversation. It's, this is you know Booker T and W E B. I mean it's mm -hmm. continuing. Um, Malcolm X and um, Martin Luther King Jr. I mean it's, it's so have we resolved it? Uh, are folks willing to give up? I mean we, the, the thing is um, the 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 question that is I didn't want to, uh, to add, which is what are you willing to give up for freedom? And that's the question. And, and, and I, a lot of my work focuses on the black middle class. And, you know, I've had in my lifetime class, class ascension, I would say. So, you know, no, uh, and that's what this, you know, we're just supposing uh, Mason came from a uh, wealthy family. Um, I'm sorry, Mason came from a working class family, but, um, um, oh my God, I'm like mixing him up. Um, yes. And then Kyle came from a uh, rich family. And so, what it means to, to, to ascend and have certain kind of comforts and then think about if you push against this and make it all crumble, you're gonna lose out and you know, you're, you finally made it, now we're gonna change course. Um, so uh, yeah, that's, that's, that's the issue. But yeah, the, the, thing, the thing about it, nothing's really changed for the show because it's the same question. Are, you know, are we going to, people, someone posted today about, see all you guys, they were, they were boat shaming um, people see, look at Biden. Let ha what happened to the Haitian folks happen? You know, the Haitian migrants. There's, we're still there. Mm -hmm. It's you know, um, and it's hard to build. You know, and, and we all know if you have something that is um, damaged, it has to be repaired before you can move on. And we've never done any repair work, so that's what really it's about. And what that repair looks like is the question. 
I think, and you know, I, and people say, which one are you? I'm like, I'm both. <laughs> but um, yeah, but, but I should say too that um, this collection includes the mama logs, which Adrian was the first person to perform in. <laughs> I did a solo reading and she helped me. Um, it was just, a, just me and her and the other fellows for our year. And um, to have it now, that's a very special uh, play to me. Black, the mama logs is about um, black middle-class single mothers and um, being unintelligible to the world and each other. And at the time I was actually at the uh, Du Bois that um, I was the first time alone with my son and trying to keep all the balls in the air, both uh, being an artist and a scholar. And it was, uh, he grew up <laughs> kind of walking around. He didn't remember anything about being there, but um, it was great to have Adrian to, to um, talk about motherhood with and to share um, this piece and to have it now out in the world. And it's gonna be, it has now has, I think three pending productions um, for next for this, this coming season because people, that's, it's, I think people feel safer about. And I also mm -hmm. think it's an un, under um, explored issue because you talk about missing motherhood is often about women who are under severely under-resourced mm -hmm. um, or white women who are doing it in that Murphy Brown kind of, you go girl. Um, and <laughs> so. Well, I'm surprised that my career path didn't change after that reading. But I'm, <laughs> I'm still doing the same thing, but you know, I'm, I'm glad that yours now. has. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I think Michael Cordova has a comment or question. Great. Hi. Can y'all hear me good? Yes. Okay. I just first off, Professor Thompson. I big fan um you know i'm at the ut i love all the work that you do i want to take class with you one day oh but, thank you but let me get to my question quickly um i'm thinking to sylvia winters uh, reflections on rethinking aesthetics and professor brown has recently made me think about that a lot and i was wondering how in the process of your writing you were left to reflect on your aesthetics particularly you know the black um feminist aesthetics that we seem to engage with a lot and it's it's you know capacious and beautiful and i'm thinking within the world of man emphasis on the capital m how we ought to reframe our present dogmas which is something that you beautifully discussed in this piece and what it means to you know repair and reframe these systems so that we can begin to open up these new doors that you know have been discussed throughout all of black studies and i think you yourself are answering to within this piece of work thank you for that rich question it has been um one i one of the things I'm really happy about is um, having um, my brothers, literal uh, brothers and other um, people who identify as African-American men feel like they hear themselves or hear genuine voices of black men in this piece. And I feel happy about that. Um, and what I love about it, for me, I'm a black feminist who loves black men, um, both black trans men and black men uh, who, who, like my son and my brothers, it, it, you know, kind of the complexity of what that means. And so that comes through in the piece and that um, there's, if those of you get a chance to read it or, or to see it, um, Dix is a feminist. And so, and it, and it comes up against his revolutionary brother's um, sexism. And so it's interesting to have the, a man doing that work around pushing um, for um, um, kind of sense of, of um, like women's humanity. So, that's something about the, the piece, but I feel like I, after seeing like female had this big splash and you know known for that um, to have this be the second play of mine that's a full length play be produced was a real switch. You know, two hand seen by females, two two hander to women, and then um, underground two men. So, um, but to be you know, considered any, anywhere in the conversation with Sylvia Winter is uh, <laughs> quite a, quite something to think about. But I just love being able to share the things that are going, the, the voices are going on in my head. Um, and I do stand on the ground of being a black feminist artist, no matter what kind of characters I um, put in the piece. Thank you. Um, current fellow Tanya has a question or comment. Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, I really enjoyed this. I can't wait to see the whole play or um, have an experience where I get to, to have more. Um, and so I was just wondering a couple of things, just thinking through this. Um, have you thought about having it performed in Brazil, Cuba, Colombia? Um, I missed the first 10 minutes of the live 
um, but it reflected a lot of the internal debates that I feel mm -hmm. are happening with Black folks in the States, <clears throat> but across the diaspora as well, with uh, the U.S. being reflected by the character that Jeffrey, I didn't catch the, the character's names, um, but that Jeffrey that. was um, yeah. reading, and um, Latin America, like the Black militancy that's coming out of Latin America right now, really seems to be reflected by the character that Mark um, <laughs> read. And so I was just wondering um, if you could comment on that and on the works diaspora possibilities. And I was wondering if the actors could just comment on how they felt to um, perform this about the debates, um, about their connection to the characters. That's Thank you question. so much. <laughs> I have to ask you later what, what, what office you're in. <laughs> but, um, it's for first of all, I have a former student who's in um, Brazil, and I would love that it, it, it to go. A couple of former students who were there um, that would love for this work to to, to travel. Um, I am not don't have a producer hat on right now. I'm starting to move into a, a director hat for next in, in, in this, this season. I'm directing some uh, uh, for the first time, but I would love for people to. I mean, in, in anywhere I think it would be great in the UK as well, but throughout the diaspora, I think in the specific is the universal for, um, so this is very African-Americans and um, in the U US and a certain generation too, and those of us who were part of the anti-apartheid protest and that are now long the tooth. And, <laughs> and my son interviewed me about that. Um, and so, um, but I'd love to hear from um, Jeffrey and um, Mark and, and even their own identities as diasporic um, black folk too. About playing the roles in, in general, what do you what do you think? Jeff, Jeff, Jeff's giving me the you go ahead, brother. <laughs> uh, that's that's a fantastic comment about the diaspora. My parents are actually from. My father was from Cameroon, and my mother's from Haiti. Um, they both came to the states for college, uh, went to the University of Michigan. But as they got older, they definitely um, imparted on me a lot of the sense that the problems that African Americans face are not unique to African-Americans. Um, and, and that's something that even though I'm, I'm literally an African-American, like I'm a Cameroonian descendant uh, in the truest sense of the word, I fully identify with um, American descendants of, of slavery um, because getting pulled over doesn't, people don't ask you, are you Haitian? <laughs> are you a Cajun Cameroonian hybrid or they don't? You know, they might ask you what your name is. Um, but I think that's a fantastic point about uh, seeing the difference between the, the, the revolutionary mindset that's coming out of Latin America. I think that's really fascinating. And I'd like to learn more about that. Uh, as far as this character, I was obviously Lisa started this work years before we met, but I'm so fortunate to have known Lisa for the last four years. Well, four years since the play, but probably five years since before that, she recruited me after watching me play Satchel Paige. And uh, I was more than happy to do a reading with her. And it's so interesting that the, 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 the play has even evolved in my time with it. Um, I think Mason and Kyle were kind of reversed before, um, uh, where Kyle was like this, had a revolutionary mindset because he'd always been fighting all his life. And I said, well, wouldn't this be more interesting if Kyle had the privilege to fail? If Kyle had uh, a, a lifestyle of, of, of luxury and privilege that allowed him to take risks and speak loudly um, for things that, you know, whether he necessarily believed in them or whether he was, you know, there are, there are parts in this play when you see the whole thing that he is sometimes too charming for his own good, but he, he is doing good, um, but he definitely has issues with women. Um, and, and that's an interesting character, but. I, I often do um, I often do a lot of Shakespeare classical work, but this character is, has fit me like a glove and uh, seeing it grow and seeing myself being able to embody it and work with Jeffrey every night, you know, for, for the, it's, it's so ironic that we've had a hard time getting it remounted because it was literally sold out every night that, that we did it. Like from the, from the first night to the last, it was standing room only every night. So, I'll, and anytime Lisa asked me to, do any project, I'll, I'll, I'll take one line in a, in a Lisa Thompson play because of this, because of this work. So I know that's a lot, that's a long answer, but that's, that's how I feel. Yeah. 
Jeffrey's like, Jeffrey. You're muted. Oh, you're, you're muted. I know you're saying a lot of good stuff, but you're muted. <laughs> um, okay. Can y'all hear me? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, back. Uh, yeah, my wife is Afro-Colombian, um, Afro-Latina, uh, Black Colombian, however you want to classify. Um, I live with my mother-in-law. Uh, where well, she lives with us. She is Afro-Colombian as well. And, you know, I'm learning about Hispanic culture. And I'm also learning about Black Hispanic culture. And I don't want, you know, to get on the bad side of, of that. So... Nothing but good thing to say about y'all over there. Um, but uh, they, they talk about uh, the economic, uh, like hardships from being um, in South America and, um, you know, Panama, Costa Rica, Nicaragua, just, um, yeah, all over the Americas, black people and brown people and indigenous people. Uh, pretty much are facing the same thing. Either, you know, their land is being taken. Um, this whole merit system with work and nepotism and the opportunities going to people that don't look like us. Um, the, the sheer amount of like resources being poured into pushing us out of places that we have gathered and taken care of, you know, over the last century that's being pushed out is happening like all over. Um, Mason is not, was not a part of me before. So I had to do what uh, Mark calls acting for, for Mason. I thought it was going to be an easy thing. I was like, yeah, man, like, you know, usually, you know, most, you know, actors will pull from what is there to fill in the gaps, but I don't agree with Mason at all, or at least not when I started this, I, I was like, yeah, burn it down. And that's, that's like, I wake up in the morning, I'm like, burn it to the ground, burn it and start over, burn it, you know? But um, as I'm getting older and I'm watching things, I can understand where Mason is coming from, especially being from nothing, working hard, doing the whole generic thing, like, being, being a black person in this country, it doesn't matter what field you're in. You have to work three, four times as hard just to reach a mediocre tier that uh, most other people would would be at. You have to be a you have to be damn near a, a astrophysicist to be a plumber if you're black. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And um, so Mason's character coming up through that. And getting where he's at, yeah, I can understand why he doesn't want to sacrifice um, anything that he's earned, anything that he currently has, um, his future plans. I can understand why he doesn't, doesn't, but do I agree? Hell no, but I can understand where he's coming from. Um, definitely like walking this Mason I don't know why I keep doing that. Can y'all hear me now? No, everybody's muted. I can't even hear nobody else. It just says mute. Everybody's got mute signals. It, it's a little quiet, but we can hear you. Hello. Can y'all hear me? No. Barely. No. Nothing. I can't hear. <laughs> I can't hear. I can't hear. Uh. So Tanya, you can hear me. Okay. So yeah, that's it. I can I can I can I can talk with my 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 right people a little and be you know a little less impassioned and hear what they're saying. I don't necessarily agree, but I can understand them better because it used to be like get the hell out of my house. I don't ever want to see y'all again. Hell out of here. What are you talking about? That makes no sense. <laughs> you know, I still can't hear anybody though. Well, perhaps um, the audio will change for you. Uh, okay, now I can, hear you. I can hear you now. Okay. And it's been um, quite a moment. This 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 play collection, uh, three plays of you know that are all just to give people some a little bit of context about that. We all had world premieres in Austin at different theaters. Well, well, two were done at the Vortex, um, and then um, that's underground and uh, the monologues and 
at the vortex, um, the, the monologues got to, got to be got to happen thanks to Christine Hong, who runs Color Art Production, uh, director of that, and also is an amazing screenwriter and, write, and, and um, playwright, who saw the reading I did at UT for the monologue. But yeah, let's get this on stage here in Austin. And then uh, Monroe was a play I wrote with a grad student at Stanford and just put in a box and friends told me, send it out, send it out. I sent it to the Austin Playhouse, had a festival of plays and ended up um, being a, um, a, a play that you know, got a lot of um, acclaim. So the book was the first um, book ever to be published that had all the plays that had world premieres in Austin. So it made it very kind of a unique little thing. But yeah, here for the Thank you. Um, Robin Bernstein. Uh, thank you. Lisa, it's so lovely to see you. And, and thank you so much for this beautiful play and for your beautiful work. Um, and it's so, just so nice to see you. And I also apologize um, because I'm going to have to leave in a few minutes before two o'clock. I have a meeting. Um, my question is about realism. Um, I'd love to know uh, what it means for you to write in a realistic uh, form, what it is that draws you about that form, and what it is that uh, you feel realism does for you as an artist. That's a great question. Um, I have realism in this piece. I, um, it's, it's kind of my, my traditional, I wanted to have a uh, my August Wilson moment um, in a bit, but you know, um, and there isn't any, um, magical realism that he has in his piece in this one. For me, it was um, the, the, comp the conversation was so heated. I wanted to put it in a place people could feel like this is a real conversation we can actually have as opposed to thinking about it. Kind of, I have other pieces that are Afrofuturists, I have other pieces who are that are more um, full of uh, vignettes and you know multiple characters, switches and all that. But this uh, was a one I thought wanted to ground in a certain way because it's so volatile. Um, because the topic is so, yeah, a lot, and especially was scary once that because it's written, of course, before the election, before he before he got elected. So <laughs> it was um, anticipating what would be the worst, and, like, and I didn't think he was going to win. I mean, and then, <laughs> then it was like then it was hard to sell it because people were like, oh yeah, <laughs> we want it. two on the nose. Um, so that but that was the why for, for this that it gives makes people a little more um, somewhere to kind of land and get their seed legs because the idea of of saying this is you know I grew up in the Bay Area during the, the 70s my parents had a building in Oakland that some of the Panthers were in my brother was involved just um growing up with that sense of possibility and seeing what happened to them uh, I can see why people are so afraid of it um and but I do think that the new generation, younger people are feeling very, um, both uh, they, they have a, an enamored with Afrofuturism at the same time, they're also enamored with the idea of, in some ways, destroying and rebuilding. And, you know, you know the calls for abolition, I mean, just so wonderful to hear that um, right now. Um, and that's why I made sure in this piece, there was a mention of the incarcerated, the uncle, you know, taught him how to play, um, to play chess and thinking about the work that I'm so happy that Nicole Fleetwood is doing around, you know, making people think aware of those who are incarcerated and um, those of us who've had family members incarcerated and letting go of some of that shame. But yeah, for me, the realism is um, also, I guess it's so scary because right now a lot of people are like, I can't believe our lives right now, is this real? And it's like realism is not, it's not just the boring stuff. It's really, you know, sometimes the scarier stuff. <laughs> and I go to the fantasy to get away from um, knowing my life chances based on the, my, you know, my, the body I was born in and the family I was born in. It's really um, frustrating. And a lot of that anger comes out in the monologues and that's where I go crazy with all the different voices because a way to deal with that, some of that rage. And I remember the reading we had at the, the voices too of the monologues with um, Coleman Domingo directed with, um, these Broadway actors were amazing, and um, one of the other fellows that was there said, "What's the you know what's the big deal? All mothers go through things, and it's like, eh, you know, not the same thing when you're afraid your kid's gonna get shot at the park. You know, it's like <laughs> it's a real you know real thing, and just the things I have to encounter around that. So um, sometimes I think for me the, the better questions of thinking about um, the fa fa the fantastic is a place for me to feel." Um, 
more comfortable and safer because realism is scarier for me. Hope that answers. <laughs> Good to see you. It's been 10 years. Okay. Um, we have a question from someone in the audience whose audio is not working well. So I'll just read her question. It's from Menuka Robin Case. Oh, um, I am Menuka. I knew her from Albany. Yes. Great. Um, she says, for me, the class issue, working versus wealthy, as well as gender issues that you just raised, connect to, quote, a play about what freedom looks like, unquote. I guess there are multiple visions of freedom, and I wonder how these visions, as well as critical analyses of long-standing issues, can work together. Could a play about freedom shape the path from one to the other? Mm. It's a beautiful question. I'm sure I'm smart enough to answer it. Um, this idea of, of um, you know, I, I think that we're even it's hard for us even to imagine freedom. I I believe, and and the especially if we're currently in trauma. I mean, you know, we have a new, new layer of trauma now with, of course, the uh, the pandemonium I call it, right? Uh, the panini. Um, so the, with with um, COVID nineteen kind of being the another thing that kind of sheds light on all the inequity we have. So what does freedom look like? What is, um, I think we all, I don't know, I really do believe that we all feel, we all know what it's, what's best and what's right and what's just. And what we, 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 the sticking point is what's possible. So people don't want to let go of, well, I know I have, 80,000 million billion dollars and I'm going to go for space in the middle of a pandemic to hang out and see what it's like. Um, I know that's, I know it's BS, but I have it and I'm just going to go for it. Sorry, guys. Um, you know, I call, being from California and now living in, in Austin, you know, these are places people see as progressive. And it's interesting because uh, one, California gave us recently the recall, but even beyond that, Reagan and, uh, and um, Schwarzenegger and all these other things that you know that go on, and those of us who grew up there know, like you, you go and drive between LA and San Francisco, you drive fast through the middle of the state and make sure you don't have to get gas. Um, so, um, and then Austin is you know this, the, 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 blue, the blue city is in the red state, but at the same time, it is has the most segregated public school system in the whole state of Texas. So this idea of people you know talking a good talk about what they want and freedom and how it, but they're not wanting to let go. So how do we you know, let go of what their own or their privileges are? And so for, and black people are, are navigating that same thing. Like, like uh, Jeffrey said, like, I, I understand where he's coming from, but you know, do I agree with him? But, and so what are the steps? And the bigger question keeps coming back to what are you willing to, what do you want to live for? And what are you willing to die for? Just become those are still lasting questions and in Monroe so I want to speak a little bit about that play which is about um, what a family has to deal with in the aftermath of a lynching I mean and and um, let me think about what it meant for my family to come from like well, my mother's side of the family to come from the most uh, on the top five of uh, places in the U.S. for lynchings in the world in the in the, in the, in the U.S. right so striking and this idea of what do you do um, who cuts the body down and what do we do after that? And, you know, so these are not, you know, these are very, very hard questions. That, and that's a very fantastical play in a lot of ways. Um, so I always wanted to kind of put that on the table too, this idea of what freedom looks like. And I think in many ways we're being still, we're still working through what unfreedom was because it's been suppressed and we're now in a new era of being that those stories being suppressed, but now, the challenges that they, had, they got people like Adrian Childs and me out here who don't say the history and are writing these books and you know what are you going to do now you have these scholars who are talking about it both nationally um, and um, internationally about what the black unfreedom has looked like and hopefully that will give the younger generation the desire to, to push against um, our fears and get to I'm hearing some pushback. Sound. That sounds better. Okay. All right. Thanks. Somebody's driving. 
and okay. listen. <laughs> Mute yourselves, folks. <laughs> Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. I'm Dwight Andrews. Would you like to speak? He's a current fellow. Oh, great. Uh, I just wanted to thank you uh, for that wonderful um, project. That writing is just uh, a very powerful. And I wanted to also thank the actors. Um, you mentioned August Wilson, who I had a wonderful opportunity to work with for about almost 20 years. And wow. part of August's gift, I always thought, was the dialogue between the men. Uh, there was a certain reality. Um, and when we would talk about it, he would say that he just listened to the characters and he just wrote down what they said. And I was so impressed with the dialogue of this, this reading. Um, it just seemed so real. Um, and so you were able to capture um, not only my own experience, but you know, I've worked in theater a lot and there was nothing that you put in their mouths. This came out in a way that made me just want to hear what these two brothers had to say. So I just really wanted to say thank you. That was my first comment. And the second comment is this play would be perfect for Atlanta. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of in Atlanta now. And this is a perpetual conversation that Atlanta has with itself, especially yeah. Black Atlanta with the increased yeah. stratification. Um, so we'll need to do a sidebar at some point and, um, and, and try to make that happen. I just thought it was wonderful work. I just wanted to say thank you. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you. Appreciate it. Thank you, sir. Um, we're almost out of time, so I have um, just one last question. When will you three be working together again? Oof. Whenever Lisa sends an email. <laughs> Whenever Lisa sends an email. Yeah. Hey, yeah. brothers. Hey, beautiful brothers. That's how they always start. Hey, beautiful brothers. Yeah. Yes. I say yes, we'll, man. Go we'll get a check, y'all. Um, I, I hope to work with them on future pieces. Um, I'm um and also i'm i'm putting it out there to the film world these two men are profound and amazing and tv um you put us on i can join the writers room and then these two men are uh, are ready for um for some serious work and, and telling our stories um the risking out on you know people not being in the coast um the, but, but the actual profession is missing out on amazing talent. So I hope we'll get a chance to maybe, maybe doing something um, hopefully sooner than later. Thank you very much, Lisa. Thank you. Thank you. And Lisa, are you working on a new piece? I know you had this prestigious residency at McDowell. Yes, it was amazing. At McDowell, I got to dig into the Black Feminist Guide to the Human Body, which is a piece that's uh, dear to my heart. It's about what it means to, uh, to to be born and age in a black uh, girl's body, particularly one that looks like mine, um, which no one ever gonna ask, never asks, what are you mixed with? Um, <laughs> and um, it's a comedy, but it's also um, surreal and it's, it can include dancers and um, hopefully um, working with a composer um, on original music. It's, it's, it's the scariest thing I've ever created. And I have a lot of support for it um, thanks to um, that um, National Performance Network grant as I'm developing it. And it's supposed to have a premiere, rolling premiere starting with the Fusebox Festival here in Austin and then go on to uh, San Francisco and Iowa. And so, and then from there, who knows what, where else, but it's, um, yeah, it's trying, it's trying to look at all the, what it means to age. I'm really thinking, I've always thought a lot about um, that because I was the fourth kid of in 14 year span and thought about my parents' age when I arrived and my siblings being older than me and um, always been fascinated with those who are older than me. And now that I'm one of them, <laughs> I wanna talk about that and that, um, that journey um, and those that don't get to stay with us as long and often look like me that because of the, uh, of the medical industrial complex works. So um, I was hoping it's gonna be a revival, a uh, girls' night would also be um, including bringing out people who are working in health, whether it's yoga specialists to uh, medical folks to, to provide resources to the women that come and everyone else that comes to the show. So before and after the show. So that's the big crazy idea. 
something really great to look forward to. I know um, our executive director, Abby Wolf, is a great fan of yours. And I'm wondering if she has a couple of last words before we leave today. Oh, how exciting. I just, I wanted to thank you so much, Lisa B. Thompson, for bringing <laughs> your brilliance and your energy back to us. Yeah. And Mark and Jeffrey, welcome to the Hutchins Center. We would, if we can bring you back in some way, we will. Um, no, but this was so, thank, I mean, just, I'll, I'll blather if I keep going. So it was really <laughs> wonderful. And thank you all, those who asked questions, thank you all for your, um, your engaging questions that really helped us to understand more about your work and, and about your craft and your art. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great thank year. You.